It's always the case with me and uh, there we go. It's, what, what, before we start things around, I just wanted to provide a very, very brief context for the Canadian marketplace. Uh, uh, even though both the American and Canadian operators have a fairly similar ecosystem of demands and customer client needs and such, there are some unique Canadianness that want to step through uh, the, uh, that provides a uh, unique context for our operator as a whole and such. Uh, essentially, we, all the operators in Canada are, are trying to cover our population of approximately 35 million people, uh, which is essentially the state of California. And the, the other aspect is that most of, uh, most of our customers are actually very near in metropolitan areas, and they're also in basically close to, close to the American border, on nearly 80% if not more of our populations within 100 miles of the U.S. border. So it's very much, even though this is a vast country of trees and rocks, we want to be sure that we have the right level of approach and the right level of focus for our clients who needs LTE. And that's why the, uh, all the operators have been very, very full and hot to trot with respect to being sure that there is appropriate levels of LTE coverage in our areas. These, this is a typical style slide that we've seen uh, uh, earlier this morning overall, uh, but it also re re uh, reflects the fact that the Canadian ecosystem is indeed a high demand data usage ecosystem for, uh, for LTE. And that's one of the reasons why we're trying to develop new frameworks and challenges from the operator environment for what we need for our RAM. Uh, the growth curve of data sets is pretty similar to that of the USA. We uh, want to be sure that we have the growth and the capacity needed overall, not just on a, on a per cell level, uh, but also network-wide so that uh, we can have networks that meet the demand of our clients and the throughput expectations that we have overall. And that's one of the aspects of this that becomes a delicate balance because we want to be sure that there is a quality of service available for our, uh, our clients' needs, but still be sure that we can actually collectively as a network handle all the, all the increasing demand of traffic and signaling that is absolutely required for what we need to do. I got to my mind. Uh, so what I'll describe is basically now the the North American ecosystem for Spectrum and how Canada and the U.S. are similar and how they differ. Essentially, earlier this uh, this panel, we described how basically back in the GSM CDMA days, uh, both Canada and the U.S. had an ecosystem of having essentially uh, a high band of 1900 megahertz band two and a low band of 850 megahertz cellular uh, band five. And everything was straightforward, everything was very simplified. All that one needed for towers and cell sites was one row of high band antennas and one row of low band antennas. And we can use that for GSM. And then for those who went into uh, UMTS WCD may move that and still have that going on board. Uh, and then use that as foundation for our LT. That was pretty straightforward on the go. That being said, due to the complexities of the network and the overall ecosystem, there has been overall increasing needs and increasing demand space overall. And one aspect of, of that is that, as I try to figure out this flicker, I'm not very good at this. Yeah, for a technology prime, it's kind of awkward with that overall. It's, uh, uh, the, and what has happened in the US and Canada is indeed AWS One was deployed for various purposes, including UMTS, including, G, including LT, and that's been more of the offload or extra service layer for most of the uh, Canadian and American markets. And so that, that ended up meaning that, okay, uh, some, some aspects can be multi-port antennas from there on in, sometimes it involved another row of antennas on the towers themselves, but even that was pretty straightforward with what we needed to do. It's a case that we want to be sure that we have that robustness that's needed overall. Then we ended up having the, uh, the FCC auctions for 700 megahertz 
in the United States, as well as the ones that Industry Canada held in Canada uh, in subsequent years. And that's when things started looking a bit more complex because obviously on the low band antenna front, we have setups that require large, large, larger spaces requirements. Uh, usually these are ending up to be six footers or eight footers in general overall. And now if we're actually are indeed talking about another row of antennas, we are looking at towers that are starting to be a bit unwieldy. And that's when there was actually further serious discussions. Of, you know, maybe we, can have, we need to actually relook at just having one row per frequency band, but more looking more at as opposed to how we have our various solutions to be sure that we are able to use the pole mounts that we absolutely require. And, and from that point onward is a more complex environment to see, well, how do we get these enhanced service offerings? Uh, obviously, there's been the AWS3 options on both sides of the border, uh, but uh, there's also some uniqueness spectrum-wise. Uh, Canada has some band 30 spectrum, much like AT&T does this side of the border. Uh, there's also a uniquely Canadian-like European like solution with band 7, an FDD 2.6 gigahertz channel that makes it now a bit weirder in that in that using these at these newer aspects overall that may only apply to only apply to AT&T or only apply to European or Canadian operators. This has introduced additional complexities as to what's needed overall and how we can use these various frequency bands for how we uh, address our infrastructure. And it's an overall challenge as to how do we get the activity with everything overall to meet the performance and meet the capacity that we need. So this is another more buzzwordy slide, but, but, but it reinforces as to how we want to have an ecosystem that is absolutely high performing and absolutely robust. And so uh, relevant to the panel we were just describing earlier, we want to be sure that we have areas that have actual work overall, oh cheers, and that still ha have absolutely strong needs for wherever the customer is held. So whether it's in the area of uh, uh, an outdoor macro site or whether it is a street lamp or wooden pole based small cell outdoor DAS, centralized rent, however you want to call it, or whether it's an in-building enterprise based solution or whether it's uh, use of an example, whether it's T-Mobile USA's uh, residential femto cell, it's always trying to determine how we have the coverage and the RF that we need so that we can have the customers with the positive experience. And that's what we want to get to. We want to get to, it is a heterogeneous network. Right? It is something that we want to be sure that we have uh, an overall need and overall performance standpoint so that we have uh, an activity and such. So it's, it's a case that we like to be sure that it's a strong performing network and an overall changing network and something that's really strengthful and, and, and robust for what we need overall. I actually don't know how I use it, I just realized. It's a bit case that... There we go. <laughs> Thank you for this. <laughs> it's a case that we want to be sure that whatever we have is, is, is relevant for our future needs overall. We need to have uh, and these, this is a classic, uh, classic performance-based slide. We want to be sure that we have the, the relevant channels that we need so that we can aggregate everything that we, uh, that we need. So part of it is indeed a marketing splash, shall we say, but also part of it is the increasing throughput demand that we need as a network. We want to ensure that everything that we have is as resilient as possible. And that's when we get to aspects like carrier aviation, aspects like higher order uh, modulation schemes. We want to be sure that, that both from a capacity standpoint that our network can handle the activities that we need, but also from a performance standpoint and yes, an advertising standpoint that we can ensure that these speeds can meet the demands and the usage patterns of our clients. Now, this introduces a, uh, some unique technical challenges to how we want to be sure that we have a radio platform and, a, and an antenna platform that is as robust as possible. And many of us have seen these following issues overall already, but it's important to emphasize where these technical issues stand and what it means overall. 
What I'm showing here on the screen is a classic uh, spectrum chart showing everything on the go from the 700 megahertz space. So if uh, one recalls uh, the auction from way back when, we have, we have the areas uh, on the left which are band 12, band 17, and looking at well, what uh, having those frequency bands uh, provided. These are uh, these, these were auctioned in various uh, areas in both the United States and Canada. Uh, in particular, the United States, this has been historically a bit more of the AT&T block. Uh, in, the, in the right side, we have the band 13 space and band 14. Band 13, which is also, has also been auctioned in Canada as well as the United States, and that has historically also been the Verizon block. We're out, and so one difference in, compared to the USA and Canada is that whereas based on larger incumbent operators, we can uh, segregate them to two different sides, saying, well, most, uh, most platforms can be tailor-made to one or the other. In Canada, essentially, most of these areas have been distributed amongst themselves in different ways, and so there are some operators that have all three of band 12 and band 13 and band 29 in one geographic area and, and maybe no 700 megahertz spectrum in others, it becomes this kludgy type of environment as to be sure that one has a various need overall. The other part, and, and is one, one thing that our friends in AT&T found uh, robustly, is that in band, the band 29 space, it's uh, being the supplemental download channel, it, pref it is meant to be a throughput uh, an augmentation, a coverage-based layer, which is great. You can transmit that out of the ba base station antenna uh, in a suitable power that you can have going on overall. The challenge is that this now rubs off against on the left side to AT&T's received portion of the, the, the band space. And so it requires both the antenna panel to be robust, but now it requires the radios themselves to have the uh, robust filtering necessary. Uh, I, I, so I know that at least in some infrastructure vendors, they've even adjusted the channel uh, center frequency just so uh, just so AT&T can actually have a robust performing network that performs down like band 29 and up like band 12 at the same time. So it's no longer a case that, okay, we'll just turn on the frequency, bang, Bob's your uncle, we have everything on the go. No, we need to be sure that is a resilient aspect so that when we do transmit uh, transmit a high power carrier that happens to be right beside AT&T's receiver you can see we want to be sure that it is uh, resilient and robust as possible. The other aspect and, and we talked about that well various speakers talked about this this morning is is looking at intermodulation in general and PIM specifically and, and one wants to look at okay how do we make sure that we have various cell sites performing the way as possible. This is a photo we took, uh, 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 it's actually not a Canadian site, it's, uh, yeah, it was, it was from Portland, and basically looking at uh, what, uh, what are the, how the operators are trying, uh, collectively, how we are trying to tr squeeze as many frequency bands in antennas as much as possible. These are multi-port antennas uh, with actual remote electrical tilt, and these are areas where we want to uh, maximize the amount of RF that's coming out of this pole mount as possible, as well as being sure that uh, it is reasonably good from an OPEX environment. So that's why they put their remote electrical tilt. That's why it, it, they want to squeeze as many ports as possible so it can, well, maybe not uh, minimize, but at least slightly reduce the number of truck rolls. So these are the types of aspects you want to have on the go. The challenge is that even within our own frequency blocks, we run into various calculations and how do we hit these intermodulation calculations. Because one part of all is that this is a classic, the, the classic PCS 1900 band uh, and such. And one aspect that happens in both state sites and especially in Canada is that there's a large number of non-contiguous spectrum. It is a case that there, uh, there are operators on the Canadian side of the border that have quite uh, some spectrum on the high, high, high portion going on in, uh, and uh, um, say C2, C3, and G in this particular space. And then some transmitter receive frequency uh, blocks on the lower end, like D and E and such. So it's a case that you want to ensure that there is a uh, a scheme where you can be able to transmit and receive in any particular frequency block as 
reliably as possible, but still now we have these more complex challenges as to what's needed and what's on the go. And of course what operators now have to do is basically create a big matrix and say, okay, in this pair we have uh, intervalization, in this pair we don't, but if we have an intervalization between a, uh, the 1900 high band and 1900 low band, we can do it here, but if it's sprint block G, we can do that. So it becomes basically this quantitative analysis as to okay, what is what are the pairings that we can be sure that we have, uh, we can protect ourselves from. And, and, and this is where the increasing auction, the increasing needs become even more relevant. Uh, Canada did not do an AWS 4 auction. However, there are relevance as to okay, what does that impact from an IM standpoint to AWS 3. We haven't even uh, uh, put up an AWS 3 radio and we're already starting to talk about this. So it's an area where even challenges of today, we want to continue with uh, trying to solve the problems as opposed to uh, and not being in a reactive format, but to be as proactive as possible to determine the overall space that we have. So, so when we, and, and from an operator standpoint, a particular Canadian operator standpoint, we have all these various frequency bands. We, uh, we have very similar to the USA, AWS 1 and 1900 megahertz and 850, which is fine and we can have the product family and product portfolio we have overall. But, what, but then once we start talking about AWS 3, well, there's some similar to USA, uh, and, then, and then when we get to the higher frequency bands, that's when there's divergence. And that's where we want to be sure that both the radio per infrastructure providers as well as the antenna providers can provide the appropriate level of performance, the appropriate level of thought process going on in. We've been spitballing this amongst telos. Like, there's nothing 100% uh, confirmed around how the blue. We're, we're doing some experimentation. We're doing some proof of concept. We're doing some trials overall, and, and still, we're still in a brainstorming phase as to what is a relevant area to to get things going. One uh, one area I don't want to be a marketing arm of Quintel, but 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 but, 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 but this this turns out to be one thought process as well as to well maybe we can actually squeeze as many frequency uh, bands as much as possible inside one pole mount altogether. And, and, and that becomes unwieldy because you have like 12 ports on the go. So how do you best get that? Well, maybe we put it, we have the manufacturer put an integrated combiner within the radio itself. So those are types of thought processes that we're, we're trying to explore with our antenna vendors and our radio vendors to be sure that we have that robustness so that we can squeeze in two ports of, uh, of, uh, of, of band 29, another two ports of band 12, another two ports of band 13, and, and everything, uh, everything else on the go, and maybe even put four, four, by, four ports for the high bands because you want four by four MIMO. So it becomes this, this scaling effect as to, okay, if we want four ports for all our high bands and, and we have all these low bands and can not even have 600 yet, it becomes a challenge as to how do you squeeze as much as possible within the space that we have and the frequencies that we have. So, th so those are the current thought processes that we Canadian operators have at the moment. And, and there's no silver bullet. We're still trying to explore what are different ways to look about doing things. Um, it's, it's, uh, well, this is, it's a monkey with bananas, but it's, uh, it's, we're looking at trying to find ways with with how do we make sure uh, that our future is fine? How do we make sure that we have the quality of performance for our customers that, that we need to have? How do we make sure that we have these level of, of characteristics with our antenna product? And so what we have a takeaway with our antenna vendors and our radio manufacturers is yes, continue to look at trying to squeeze as many frequency bands in these macro uh, antenna radomes as possible. And yes, try to work with our radio infrastructure vendors to see, okay, what can we do from a, a major wide band type of a radio product, <coughs> possibly a radio that uh, incorporates 1900 as well as 2100. And how do we, how can we reduce the amount of PIM that we have out there? There can be possibly active mechanisms within the radio itself so there can be IM uh, mitigation. How do we continue the technology evolution so that we can continue to have 4310 components so that reduces the PIM? And those are the types of pressures that we're trying to put to our infrastructure vendors in the future. And, that, and that's where we stand today as an operator, and thanks for your time.